distinction is 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 really important because also just psychologically in the standpoint of a co-op for a cooperative member um i've seen it where people come into it thinking of it as pay this is my pay this is my wage my salary and it's really misleading because it's like no this is the surplus and we get to decide how much surplus to distribute so we can set those rates at whatever rate we want to set them like it's a collective decision that gets made um so his question is kind of like what's so, so it's a very political thing always, like, what do you set the rate at? And I think it's political in cooperatives, too. It's like it's, it's, a, it's a decision. In his other book, um, How to Create a Solidarity Enterprise, when he talks about this question about pay rates, he uh, lays out three scenarios. One of them is this kind of weighted scenario, but another one is just, you know, equal pay, just flat pay rate. And, I, and he puts it out there as like, you have to decide which of these do you think, which of these things do you want to do? And he has an argument for why he thinks the economic dynamics are going to be thrown off if you just do a flat pay rate. But he recognizes it's a political decision. And I feel like in some co-ops, you know, the solidarity that you get from a flat wage rate may be more important for the health and the kind of continuity, the existence of the co-op than the economic rationality of paying you know a weighted system it just may be the weighted system gonna is gonna look too much like inequality to people and it may undermine the co-op right so right. so i feel like it's it is fundamentally just a kind of political decision um one other thing i would note one co-op here that i worked with this this landscaping co-op that i uh, kind of advise them a little was they had an interesting thing which is they had a higher rate for for stonework not meaning masonry or skilled stonework but moving stone because picking up loading and moving stone is really physically difficult and and potentially uh you can get hurt right so they paid that at a higher rate yeah you know so that that valuation um doesn't necessarily have to be set by the market there's also a way in which the co-op itself can do that um for sure oh, just one other for thing sure. to throw out there that should be noted that he doesn't i think do enough with the c factor the idea that you like in you this chart to... <laughs> yeah in these charts he's not he's re he's looking at technical skill these different things exactly that's doesn't... exactly what i was going to say Oh, well, let's come back to that then in a minute. No, 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 go for it. No, I'm glad that, you know, we're thinking the same way about this. Yeah, I mean, I looked at the list of functions yeah. and while I was going to point out, he actually says in the paragraph up here, um, yeah. highlight, it is, you know, so in the process of establishing, you know, these weights, um, yeah. the, the co-op could establish the valuations that the market habitually ignores. For example, contributions workers make to the societal integration of the group. That is the C factor. Contributions which are undoubtedly of great importance and value in this type of enterprise. But then when we look down here, where is the C factor listed, right? right. It's like that's not a function, even though he just said it's incredibly valuable, which it is from anybody who has experience. Like it's probably the most important. And yet, yeah. and we had this at the worker co-op, you know, former worker co-op that I helped some friends start was, you know, th there was a guy there who was, you know, the peacemaker. And he mm -hmm. was the like, I can, you know, could listen to anybody's stuff and like, it, and was really like served that. And he didn't do like the complicated stuff. He did all the basic, what would be like basic, simple labor here. Um, yeah. But like he served that particular purpose in the group dynamic that was super important. Um, but it's like, you know, we can say, you know, so somebody who's a bookkeeper or something, you say like, well, what did you do to get those skills? And they say like, well, I went to the school and I did this and I took that certification. You say like, well, what, you know, you know, my friend, you know, I'll call him John. John, what did you do to get your skills? Like, mm, well, let's see, I had an incredibly like abusive uh, upbringing and <laughs> made me like very yeah. observant of people and then i had to go through a bunch of like dealing with my own stuff and that made me very like empathetic and now i you know <laughs> it's like how do you value that it's like you know it's like when i and i've been working on it for like you know 35 years and <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's like and but that doesn't even make the list even for somebody like rosetta who's thinking yeah. in terms already when he actually gets to putting numbers down 
that goes out the window. And I think the reason of one of the big reasons, and this is kind of maybe a trap of him trying to work within the economics paradigm, is that mm. anything that cannot be quantified is devalued by default. If it's easily quantifiable, that gets a value put on it, right? It gets a, a dollar sign put on it. And things that are you can't really put a dollar sign on, they mm. just zero. They just kind of get a zero by default, right? Is and and so i mean i think that you know he's right you know it, that kind of problem it runs into because it's like these a lot of these you know soft skills or or things that you know the care work is the you know feminist economists would um have it, this kind of you know things it's yeah. not easy to put a value on it or like you know it's not like so simple as like okay you paid how much to get your degree you know it's very these are very different kinds of things and that, you know, I think, you know, definitely need to be worked in. And I don't know if this kind of, you know, um, system is a good way to to do that or not. I mean, you've mentioned that, that you know, this is something that the DISCO, the distributed cooperatives uh, have, have worked on. I don't know if you want to comment on how they've worked that in, if you have any yeah, insight. A, I mean, it's a really interesting... It's an interesting question. I don't know if it's the same process ultimately or a different process, but it's also, I mean, it, it is still a distribution of surplus questions, but the what the disco folks do when they organize the distribution of the surplus is they say, we're going to distribute some of it for your livelihood work, which is the work that brings in revenue. And so these, all of these things on the chart would have would apply to livelihood work. Those are all sort of livelihood work things, right? Mm -hmm. Although some of those things, administrative work, and some of these other things are not actually bringing in revenue, right? Those are those are just uh, overhead, as they say. Those are those are costs to the cooperative that nobody's paying you to do that. Like <laughs> you just have to pay for it out of the revenue that you're getting from the actual work you do, right? So there is a already some a distinction there but in the disco is it's just that the the when you distribute surplus you distribute it for the livelihood work that brings in the money for the care work which is a pretty broad category it, it can mean care in the more specific interpersonal you know taking care of each other sense it can mean a kind of broader sense of like i think for example some overhead worker, administrative work, or even so-called management work could conceivably be thought of as care work. Um, oh, for sure. The person who facilitates the regular meetings of the co-op members and makes those be productive and healthy meetings is, you know, that seems a lot like care work to me. But they, so anyway, they have like this bucket of money that comes in from livelihood work some of it goes to livelihood. Some of it goes to a bucket for care. So the hours you spent during care work get uh, paid. And then some of it goes to love work, which is the solidarity or pro bono work or the contributions to the commons that the co-op does. So, you know, it, like the landscaping co-op that I mentioned, Organa Gardens, like they, you know, their solidarity, their, their love work was for example, tabling at a farmer's market in, su in support of a political cause, like not promoting themselves, but um, doing work that was kind of in the general idea of promoting permaculture, for example, that would be for them important work to support. So that method, you know, that's another way to think about the distribution. It, it seems to me it's not exactly the same as what Rosetta is doing here, it's not contradictory. Right. So the two things could be integrated. Yeah. 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 Um, no. And I don't not... think, well, I would say, I don't think, I think, I think that stuff goes out the window. It's a little <laughs> too strongly put. I don't think that, I think the point here is that what Rosetta is trying to do is just expl is come up with like, here's how you could create this waiting system. And I don't think he's intending this to be, this is the exhaustive thing and how it's going to be done. This is just sure. more like, I need to establish that you could have a waiting system and it would make sense. Right. Um, but I do think it's a weakness. Like it would have been better if he 
address the question of how do the C factor things get counted in, in that. And you could, I'm not sure you couldn't put dollar signs on those things, right? I mean, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. HR no, people get paid for the for the corrupt, rotten version of care work that they do. You know? Sure. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, you could say like, okay, you know, John, you spent an hour after the meeting, after that rough meeting, patching things up with everybody and getting everybody to feel okay. All right, and and your labor doing care work, you know, is uh, weighted at you know, five point five yeah. or what. <laughs> you know? oh, you, I mean, I, yeah, there are ways you could, you could apply that. But I did see when I was reading it, I had the same reaction that you did. I was just kind of like, well, wait a minute, why? You just said this great thing about we we can have other standards, we can we can have other criteria here, and then you make a chart and they're not in there. Like, that's frustrating. Yeah. It'd be nice to see them. Um which so but my only other you know critique and it's not really a critique so much because as you said you know Rosetto's offering this as an example of like a proof of concept kind of like you could do this um and i'm sure he is not you know set on any of the particular numbers involved i still however think it's interesting looking at the numbers that he chose just like looking at the you know particular list of skills that he chose and didn't show choose so i did just want to take a look at this so the the weights that he comes up with um you know range from one to seven point five which in my understanding i mean it was so that's you know basically a pay differential between the highest and lowest paid employee of 7.5 um which sounds pretty good and i've definitely i remember reading years ago an interview with a large worker co-op in the u.s and with the the ceo um and they were you know kind of bragging about the fact they only got paid 10 times as much as the lowest paid member so um you know 7.5 and that's I'm sure Mondragon, I think, is around there for most of the, many other co-ops um, for that kind of pay differential. Um, and it looks pretty good, of course, in comparison to the, you know, traditional economy where we have, you know, large corporations with pay differentials of 360, 400 to one or whatever. Um, still, this is something and where I, you know, maybe just have a fundamental disagreement with, you know, with a lot of people um, or there's just you know not any you know we just look at things differently but to me still even this um, this rate of 1 to 7.5 is not like it doesn't it's not rational it's not logical um, because like I think about what does it mean well so one thing I'll say and this is just funny right so Lewis Rosetto Migliaro wrote this book and the his hypothetical worker who gets paid the most in this co-op is Lewis M. I'm just saying. I thought it was funny. Um, <laughs> uh, so at any rate, Lewis M. in this uh, example makes um, you know 7.5 times what Pedro and Juan make. So I read that as saying like, so Louis can come just come in on Monday, right? And then and then not come in for like a week and a half, right? The rest of that work week and then like half of the next work week come in for like half a day on Wednesday, you know. <laughs> and uh will get paid the same as if as Pedro and Juan working like 5 days a week, right? So if Pedro works seven and a half days, like full days, which is two and a half or a week and a half of like a work week, one and a half work weeks, he gets paid the same as Lewis working one day. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which to me is does not does not connect. Like I have a really hard time buying that, that, OK, if, you know, we're both going to work 40 mm -hmm. hours a week. And you just get paid seven and a half times what I make. Okay, that maybe sounds reasonable, but but when I kind of switch the way I think about it, around like, wait a minute, that means, I like literally you could make the same thing I make with only working one day every week and a half. <laughs> like that doesn't sound right. Um, so like to me, it, it 
I think like maybe 1.85, 1.25, 1.5. I think like our maximum pay differentials reasonably like in a philosophically defensible way would definitely not get above like one to two or one to three maybe. I don't know, you could make an argument, but when it starts getting up to like this, to me, I think like it's inconceivable that somebody can create as much value in a single day at work as somebody else in a week and a half, you know? But this is, okay, so, <laughs> right. So one thing I um, think, the, the, last thing the last thing you said is helpful, I think, is that it's thinking about it in terms of creating value as opposed to pay rates. Mm -hmm. If you think about it as pay rates, it just really locks you into this idea of wage rates or what we're getting paid. And those we know are based on capitalist exploitation. Like the reason the pay rates for workers are what they are is to generate surplus value, right? Like that's the whole point. Whereas in the co-op, everything belongs to all the workers, right? So in that sense, that dynamic is kind of off the table. So the, the question here is, what are people bringing to the uh, process? And then the question just becomes, is it conceivable that somebody, so like the farmer I was working today, the farmer, is she bringing 7.5 times as much to the process of what we were doing today? Like we we're most of the time she was harvesting, I was harvesting. Her harvesting skills, I would put at certainly two twice as good as mine or three times as good as mine. She just has more skill and she knows how to harvest more plants and she does it better. <laughs> so she's just got, she brings that skill to it. So you could make an argument that like there's a that level, but then while she's there doing all this, she's simultaneously running through her head, the numbers, who needs to get what, what stuff needs to be packaged in what way in order to go to this person. She's doing a tremendous amount of administrative labor while she's in the field with me that I'm completely not doing. And if you took me out of that picture, it would not have anywhere near the impact on the farm and its production. If you took her out, the thing collapses. So there's something that in that sense, I feel like it's rational to see that and to recognize that and to mm -hmm. recognize that the production process that we're involved in has those differences and that they're very meaningful and that therefore, um, and, and that they should, in his framework, you should pay for the factors of production that are involved. Like you should value them, right? You mm -hmm. recognize the value flows. Where's the money come? Where does the value come from? And do something to, to maintain it and sustain it. So that's the framework of this. So to me, it's like, um, if you think of it as pay rates and pay rate differentials, <clears throat> then personally, I'm kind of like, I, I think a flat rate is the way to go. I just don't. I, and so like a sustainable economies law center, flat pay right. rate. You can be a lawyer. You can be someone sweeping up the office of your first day at work answering phones. It doesn't matter. You just do a flat pay rate. That's a political decision that I think is that I'm pretty sympathetic to. Um, but... Um. It's, is it rational? It, like, I don't know that that's particularly...